questions. But I'm just going to start by reading um, reading a passage. Uh, and this is Psalm, Psalms 104. Uh, bear with me. And it says this, Psalm 104 says, Praise the Lord, my soul. Lord, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. The Lord wraps himself in light as with a garment. He stretches out the heavens like a tent, and he lays the beam of his upper chambers on their waters. He makes the clouds his chariot and rides on the wings of the wind. He makes winds his messengers, flames of fire his servants. He sets the earth on its foundations. It can never be moved. You covered it with the watery depths as a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. But at your rebuke, the waters fled. At the sound of your thunder, they took to flight. They flowed over the mountains. They went down into the valleys, to the place you assigned for them. You set a boundary that they cannot cross. Never again will they cover the earth. You make spring pour water into the ravines. It flows between the mountains. They give water to all the beasts of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. The birds of the sky nest by the waters. They sing among the branches. He waters the mountains from his upper chambers. The land is satisfied by the fruit of his work. He makes grass grow for the cattle and plants for the people to cultivate, bringing forth food from the earth. Wine that gladdens human hearts, oil to make their faces shine and bread that sustains their hearts. The trees of the Lord are well watered, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted. There the birds make their nests. The stork has its home in the junipers. The high mountain belong to, mountains belong to the wild goats. The crags are, the, are a refuge for the hyrax. He made the moon to mark the seasons and the sun knows when to go down. You bring darkness, it becomes night and all the beasts of the forest prowl. The lions roar for their prey and seek their food from God. The sun rises and they steal away. They return and lie down in their dens. Then people go out to their work, to their labour until evening. How many are your works, Lord? In your wisdom, you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. There is a sea, vast and spacious, teeming with creatures beyond number, living with things, living things both large and small. There the ships go to and fro, and Leviathan, which you formed to follow there. All the creatures look to you to give them their food at the proper time. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they're satisfied, satisfied with good things. When you hide your face, they are terrified. When you take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. When you send your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. May the, Lord, may the glory of the Lord endure, endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. He who looks at the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord all my life. I will sing my praise to God as long as I live. May my meditation be pleasing to him as I rejoice in the Lord. And may sinners vanish from the earth and the wicked be no more. Praise the Lord, my soul. Praise the Lord. So um, let me go back to my presentation. And I'll, yeah, I'll just I'll talk you through um, what uh, what happened. So um, basically, this was uh, this was back in 2005 during the time when I was completing my PhD at Exeter Uni, and I was attending my uh, my local church in uh, in Exeter, which is Belmont Chapel. I was going there regularly, but uh, being at university, there was also the Christian Union uh, at the university. But I hadn't ever really gotten involved with that particularly, and so. Um, for, for some reason, I can't remember who it was or why this happened, but someone uh, asked me if I would like to come and play in the band at the Christian Union one evening. And this was, this was like a one-off that I'd never, you know, hadn't been before. I you know, hadn't really ever got involved. Didn't know many people there. Um, but I, um, but I you know, said that I would go along. Now, I'm not, without wishing to cast aspersions on anyone, it's, it, um, and I hope uh, no one's offended by this, but church bands are not necessarily always packed full of the most gifted uh, musicians around that have got music degrees and all that kind of thing. Some of them are, are wonderful, of course, but, but what I'm saying is a church band welcomes, you know, all comers. If you can come in and have a go and, um, you know, play in tune, that, that's fine. So I was expecting that sort of thing. And I've been playing in church bands for years, thinking that I would be fine just to turn up and join in with this band. Um, but the CU band, in this particular case that I, that I went to join and play play with was full of these incredible musicians all studying their music degrees and so on uh, and I got there and I was expecting to be given normally we get given what's called tab which is as a guitarist or a bass player which just tells you the chord essentially the note to play and it's just got the letter for you and I don't I'm not a um 
I don't read music, but instead of being given the tab I was expected, we would, I was just given sheet music, which to me may as well be in a, in a different language. Um, on, in some cases, just given the key. So I was just muddling my way through, too embarrassed and ashamed to admit that I didn't, that that wasn't enough for me, that I needed a bit more guidance. So I sort of muddled my way through, um, did my best, but immediately, having already gone somewhere, I felt a little bit uncomfortable, didn't know many people. I felt even more uncomfortable and kind of a bit ashamed that I wasn't of the standard that perhaps they were expecting. Anyway, we, we had the, the, the worship at the start and then the speaker of the evening came on and um, I, although I had I felt a bit uncomfortable being there, I found myself being quite taken what the speaker said. I don't remember specifics at the time, so it's you know more than 15 years ago, but what I do remember is it, he talked about going out on mission and being asked if God asks you to serve, are you willing to go? And went through all and then asked you know, for a response, people to stand up if you were willing to go. And despite myself, I found myself standing up and, and you know, uh, agreeing to go, committing commit myself to something, to serve God some, somehow. But I didn't know how I was going to do that. Um, and anyway, I, I, I bumbled my way through the, the closing song, left. Uh, I, I don't think I went back again to see you. I still, I was still involved in my home church, but wasn't about it again. And I left feeling silly, thinking, well, I've just shown myself up in a, in a band where I clearly wasn't talented enough to play in. Um, not that anyone else was saying that to me at all, I'm, you know, just, to, it was just that was just my own thinking. And then thinking, oh, now I've also volunteered for something that I'm not going to do. Why, have I, why did I stand up when I, I'm not intending to go anywhere, do anything? So that was like a one-off thing. I happened to be there for that moment to say, yes, I, I will go and, I'll, and I will do this. Anyway, some weeks later, in the, back in, in my home church, we had a church member there who was completing his PhD uh, in Middle East studies. And he wanted to take a group of church members out to Syria and Lebanon to learn about the culture and history to, to um, immerse us in that, in that region and teach us about it and get us to meet various people that he had contacts with out there, take us to mosques and things like that. And I, that was very much out of my comfort zone, felt completely unprepared for that. But I thought back to what I said at the Christian Union evening a few weeks before and said, well, you know, without realizing I've already volunteered myself for this. So I, there's no way out of this now, really, I suppose. Um, so I, I agreed to sign up. So I joined the team to sign up and we raised some money and, and we got ourselves out there. So this is a team that I went with. I knew very few of these people on, on leaving. Uh, there are two people there. If you look from the left hand side and, and come into the third and fourth person in from the left. The two people that I did know, uh, they're, they're called John and Rachel Bishop. I knew them in the church, wasn't particularly close to them, but everyone else would, would I was kind of meeting for the first time. So um, I joined this team and we flew into Beirut and as an overview of the whole uh, time there, we traveled around Lebanon, then we moved on to, to Syria. We visited some mosques, went into these mosques and saw what they were like, both Shia and Sunni mosques. And we were learning about the history of the region. And we saw some of the evidence of the um, violence as, as we blighted that part of the world. I can move my slides. So that there you can see the kind of buildings. I, I mean, I've got some pictures. I haven't got lots of pictures. I, I wasn't taking pictures peripherally back then like I am now, but you could see lots of the buildings. You could see, you know, bullet holes and and um, and, the, and the damage from the sort of from the the, the war torn uh, times that 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 Beirut and uh, and, the, and that region has experienced. Um, the other picture you can see there is uh, the it was a uh, what's the word like a like a memorial to um. Ruth, Rafiq Hariri, who was the Lebanese prime minister um, who had been assassinated earlier that year. And Hezbollah, the, um, the militant group uh, that, that you might well have heard of, were responsible for it, but it also turned out that it was very likely that Syria were behind it. So the, the tensions between the two countries that we were gonna visit as well. Um, and other, other things we saw as well as, as well as the damaged buildings, I mean, it was just really striking to us driving down the roads. They would have pictures up lining the street, huge pictures um, of, of martyrs who, who died suicide bombers essentially who, who died for Hezbollah in various attacks that they've done so it was a you know it was a, it was a big uh, culture shock very very different from anything we used to here in the west um some other things that we did there whilst we were in Lebanon we um we visited some Christian families that were there and learned about the challenges that they were facing and you know it really struck us that generally in the UK it's relatively easy and safe to be a Christian certainly you know in, in the vast majority of cases that we, we would never find our lives in danger or to be you know, worried about if people found, found out that we were practicing Christians, but that was the, the lived experiences of these people. And we knew that before going, of course, and, we, and we'll all be aware of that sort of thing that goes on around the world. 
but it's a very um, powerful experience to sit in someone's home and have them talk about that experience and yet have them see them being so full of joy and praise for God and so, um, uh, you know, so moved by, by the, the power of the Holy Spirit working in these people. So it was a, a really powerful experience. Um, one of the young men we met lived on his own in a, in a small um, kind of basement flat. He was a convert from Islam and he'd been brought up to sing the Quran, sing the verses from the Quran. But um, he was telling us about how now he, uh, instead of singing the Quran, he, he sang the Bible and he sang to us in Arabic some, some verses from the Bible. And, and it was, uh, you know, again, a really beautiful, quite moving experience to hear this young man singing to us in, in that way. Um, Another unique experience we had from that time we went into, uh, I've got some more pictures, I think I'll just keep going through. So, um, yes, yeah, so this is more of Lebanon. To, another thing that was really evident to us was the, the um, how much violence was a part of that community. That's you know, just a picture of, of Lebanon you can see there and the sea. But they had this, the, the picture on the left there was this tower of, I don't know if you can see in there, that's tanks, tanks from uh, the you know, war that had happened previously there that they built into this, Big concrete pillar and hard to get a head on, you know, in one sense it was like a you know almost like a, a glorification a memorial of that of that violence and war and a, and a memory but there was just signs of that stuff all over the place as we went around um to me i've got, got this picture it looks like i'm i don't know trying to pose for a band cover or something i don't know what quite i'm doing to do there but we're one the reason i read that psalm earlier is that while we're in lebanon as well and this is this is a cedar tree it's me up a cedar tree um we we were struck by how in psalms like that that you read that talk about the mountains and the animals and the cedar trees and and all those sorts of things that and for anyone else who who's visited this part of the world you'll have experienced this as well that it's a really um uh you you feel much more in touch with those biblical verses right um that uh that talk about that you know they're, they're, uh, many of them are written about that part of the world Um, that yeah that, that that part of the world is is you, you feel much more I don't know uh, the, the bible comes alive I guess that much more because it's written much of it was written in that part of the world and about that part of the world and yeah just as well going back to some of the pictures here this is from some of the mosques that we visited uh, and they were are beautiful places and, and and again the other difference with that region is the the sense of spiritual spirituality that is around you know obviously lots of people practicing islam but compared to the uk where you, it feels like a very secular society it's very different over there one big difference between the two types of mosques is shia mosques that were really kind of ornate and beautiful the sunni mosques we visited much more kind of much plainer in terms of decoration and things which was an interesting contrast to see but that's um, just some of the mosques that we have visited and and um and spent some time in Yeah, and then this is again that was talking about the the psalm and some of the uh, some of the landscapes that we saw again just felt like that felt like that had that real kind of biblical feel like this is these are the places that I read about in the Bible and in the Psalms. Okay, and then just moving on, just getting to a picture, just, just other thing. The food there was incredible as well, but I just get onto another picture I wanted to show you. Oh, there it is. So one other unique experience that we had there. So this isn't my picture, by the way. I found this um, off Google, but um. Another unique experience we had while we were there was we went into uh, the Syrian desert and met some Bedouin people and talked to them about, about their lifestyle and what, uh, how they live their lives. We spent an evening in one of their tents. We ate a really nice chicken and rice dish and we drank some sweet tea. And one of the things that stayed with me, and it was exactly like this, to have a, have a, like a kettle like that in these little was like shot glasses of this hot sweet tea. And it was one of the nicest drinks I've ever had in my life. And uh, you know, I've always, I've been to other similar areas and tried the tea they have there nothing's been as good as what i got served by the by these bedouin who welcomed us into their tent and served us sweet tea so that was another really um, amazing experience and then <clears throat> so just um moving on another uh experience we had there towards the end of the trip um we visited a, a greek orthodox monastery up in the mountains and I'm not sure if this was there or on our way there particularly, but um, uh, we went to a mass uh, in, this, in this church and it went on like a very long time, very long time. Uh, and we were all tired. It was very hot, obviously we were in the desert uh, and we had to hike up this enormous 
you know, hill set of steps to, to get up to the top of this monastery. And again, you know, it's beautiful and amazing place and, and enjoyed our time there. Um, however, another memorable experience was they were doing some construction up there. Uh, yeah, and they were having to winch up some bricks and materials using a pulley system from the ground level all up the side of this mountain to whatever they were kind of restoring or, or rebuilding, repairing up there. And we, we've been in, we had the mass and stuff, and then we're leaving again later on in the day, sort of, I think early afternoon or evening. And we just climbed all the way back down these enormous amount of steps. And then we heard a shout from above. And for some reason, someone had lost control of this zip line and it had like a hammock thing with the materials in it. And it was whizzing back down the mountainside completely out of control. So they were shouting down to warn us down the bottom where, where it was gonna um, hit and land. And it would come down to exactly where we were stood. And again, I can't remember the reason why, but I had lots of bags on me. I was carrying a lot of the luggage that we had. And I kind of didn't see what was going on. I last to realize what was happening. And you see the chap stood next to me in this picture there. He's called Robin. Uh, I, as I looked, he, he leapt away from me. He saw what was happening and he leapt away from where I stood. Uh, and there was a huge crash. And, um, and everyone had like scattered for cover. And I was just kind of stuck in place. Uh, and, it, and for a moment, I could see nothing just I could see nothing at all everything was just kind of like a like a, a yellow kind of haze nothing at all and I and I you know genuinely wondered for a moment if that if that was it if I you know if I if, if you know, there'd been an accident and, I, and that was it I was I'd, I'd been killed but um I realized that the reason I couldn't see was because this whatever it had been in there had exploded into this huge cloud of dust that had covered everything and covered me and I was I was washing dust out of my hair you know, days and days and days after the, you know, this, this event, I was covered from head to toe. I looked to my left and Robin, who'd been stood next to me, was like 30 foot away, had, like hiding behind a set of steps. Um, I don't think there's ever in any real danger. I don't know what was in the, the thing, but certainly it was, a, it was a memorable moment and experience. And, I, you know, I don't know if, if, if God's hand was, was over me protecting me from that, but um, certainly uh, it was, yeah, it was, it was memorable to say the least. So this all, uh, oh yeah, I've just got a couple more pictures perhaps that I'll show you. I think there's many more. Yeah, I think that might be the last one, in fact. Yeah, so that was just from up there and that, you know, looking out over the, over the desert. So that, that whole experience and our time there and the conversations we had and meeting with the other Christians and, and talking, being able to talk to these other Christian families out there uh, and, and being able to have such a sense of freedom to share and talk about our spirituality, whilst it is obviously an, an Islamic culture, um, people there were much happier than I expected to talk about Christianity and about Jesus and, and about God. Uh, and that's perhaps something that's, that for me, I can forget that I can be less comfortable doing that in a, in a weird way here at home than I was over there in Syria, even, even though that there is that strong Islamic culture. Um, and, for, and for me in my own life, it was a time in my life where there was some transition going on in my life and I wasn't quite sure where I was going. And so for me to have an experience to see how God was working in people in another part um, of the world so far removed from my experience and seeing the, the culture and the difficulties faced by Christians like nothing I'd ever experienced before. It really helped me to understand much more, have a much more worldly view about, about our faith and about how God is working in our faith and about um, the, the, I guess, the, the challenges that, com that confront us and, and missionaries in, in trying to spread God's message around the world. Um, and there's so much that was just wonderful about that part of the world. You, know, you think Syria and Lebanon, it's not as if those are places that you would, that you would um, think they might want to visit. And of course, it, since we've been there, that's become the, the uh, there's been more challenges uh, involved with, in visiting that part, part of the world, which is such a shame because I, I would love more people to visit there safely. It's, it's they're really wonderful places to go and see. And the people there are, are so kind and friendly and welcoming. Uh, it's very easy to have a Western centric view of God and our faith, I think. And maybe I'm guilty of that sometimes. But actually, you know, the world is much bigger than our little corner. And, and that's that's the region of the world where Jesus chose to come and walk the earth. So I think it's a special place to go and visit and and, uh, and be there. And it'd be no would be no bad thing for us to devote more of our thoughts and prayers to that part of the world, especially considering the trouble um, that it that it is, has experienced for so many years. Now, in terms of it afterwards um, and the impact on, on, on me and others in, on the group, one thing that was interesting, it was a significant trip for several members of the group. The trip leader uh, called Craig, 
he met his wife in that group. She was in that picture at the start. So they didn't know each other before, met on that trip and got married. Uh, and also Robin, uh, my friend who um, had um, say, like dived away to save himself, uh, me and him stayed friends and I was living in a shared house at the time. And he ended up marrying one of my housemates that he met through me through friendship. So I'm not saying that the purpose of the trip was to marry people off again, but we married, but it was interesting that there was a sense of God's plan for people coming together through the connections made in that group at that time. Because that was at one time that group of people were ever together. Had that group not been together, you know, Debbie and Craig wouldn't have met and Robin wouldn't have met his wife, Vera. Uh, and that, that happened through them. And that, you know, believe that God is now working through through their lives and, and their and their families. Uh, in terms of God's plan for me, there was a couple, as I mentioned before, the couple on that trip called Rachel and John Bishop. And uh, I already knew them in my church, but I wouldn't say I was uh, close to them, but I got close to them during that, that time, of course, because they were the people I knew already. And, and, they're, and also because they were really wonderful, lovely people. Um, and I found out at the time while we were there that they were both, they were both at that time teachers at Oakhampton College. And Oakhampton was not a town that I knew much about other than you drive past it on the A30 on the way to Cornwall, when living in Exeter at the time. And I then finished my PhD and trained to teach. And, you know, in a, in a big way, because of those two, the, the one place that I wanted to get a job and teach at, and that was Oakhampton College. And in fact, the head teacher often jokes with me that one of the things I said in my interview, when he said, why Oakhampton? I said, I know the bishops. And he thought I was referring to the bishops of the Southwest or something. Rather, and then I explained, no, no, and John and Rachel Bishop who work here. And they said a lot of wonderful things about it. And that's why I want to come here. So you know, it was very much, again, through that trip that I got that much closer to John and Rachel and, that, and that's what's brought me to, to here where I am now. So, and again, I didn't realise that until years later that perhaps had I not, you know, had I not in that Christian union, when someone had said to me, do you want to come to Christian union meeting, which I, which I hadn't been involved with, I said yes. And I did go. And then when I left that, I felt like I'd made a mistake. You know, I shouldn't have been there. I didn't fit in and it wasn't the right place for me to be. And I'd made a commitment I wasn't going to live up to. But actually, that, 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 the, the two moments of saying, yes, yes, I'll go to the Christian Union, and then standing up when the, when the speaker said, are you willing to go? As well as those experiences I had out there, that's, that, yeah, I don't know, I don't know how directly, but has certainly played a very big part in me ending up being part of this church community. And had I not been, said yes to those two, those two things from 16 years ago, I might not be able to be here to talk to you now because I, I might not have ended up where I am now. So, it's a reminder for me that, um, that God has a plan for all of us and that every act of faith, no matter how small, if we're willing to say yes, then that can help um, God's plans be realized in our lives. And that's it for me.